Good morning. Uh, don't turn to James just yet. If you have your finger still there, you can keep it there. We will be getting to that, to James chapter 4. But take your Bibles and turn to Je the book of Judges with me, if you would. Judges chapter 16. Uh, this morning in Sunday school, we, we started. You're, you're getting, if, if you weren't here for Sunday school, you missed out on the first half of the message. Uh, we'll try to catch you up. But uh, it's, uh, Lord laid two separate messages on my heart, but the two work together uh, very well. Uh, and uh, so that's, this is the way we're going we're gonna to go with it. J Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. We, we, we spoke about Samson this morning. And we looked at the Nazarite vow and how, how, how God called out Samson to be different from those that were around him. It wasn't a vow that Samson made. Uh, the angel appeared in, in Judges chapter 13. We won't read it, but in Judges chapter 13, the angel appeared unto Samson's mother. We don't know her name. It was just the wife of Manoah. Uh, she had been barren up until this point, uh, but the angel said that she was going to bear a son. And that because her son was going to be a Nazarite from the day of his birth, that she was not to drink uh, of, of any strong drink, that she was to, to, to separate herself from the same things that a Nazarite would have to separate him, uh, himself or herself from. So, so uh, uh, in, in, in all that, uh, once they established that it was God that had sent the, sent, uh, the angel to, to her, uh, the, the angel appeared twice at the second time, uh, both, uh, both the woman and her husband uh, talked to the angel, and then they, they, they made a sacrifice unto God, and they watched, we didn't cover it this morning, but uh, they, the, they watched the angel ascend uh, in, through the fire up into heavens, and, and they knew then that they, had, that they had been in the presence of the angel of God, and, and they knew that, that, that they needed to follow the, 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 the command of, the, the, of this angel. This was a command of God. It was not just somebody coming along and telling them this. So, so she, she, be, she began to separate herself from those things. We looked at what a Nazarite vow was, and in, in a Nazarite vow there were three commands. Uh, uh, they, were, they were not to drink of any strong drink, and not just not drink of strong drink, but they weren't to have anything to do with anything of the fruit of the vine. Uh, they, they weren't allowed to eat even of the skin of the grape. Uh, it was uh, not that eating grapes is wicked or evil, but it was uh, to separate themselves from that. They weren't allowed to touch anything that was dead. Uh, if they touched something that was dead, they had to uh, cleanse themselves. And there was a purification process where they would have to shave their head and, and kind of start their vow all over again, right from that very spot. And, and then the third thing was, that the third uh, vow that they made, or that they or showed they were in this vow, was they weren't to cut their hair. Their hair was to grow. Now, uh, it, back in Numbers chapter 6, it talks about these these things and it talks about uh, how that you could have a, a it could be for a lifetime vow or it could be a period for a period of time uh, some people that we don't know how many people did the Nazarite vow the Bible doesn't record all of that there were there were a few uh, but but uh, uh, we do know that some could do it for just a short period of time but but Samson's vow was for his entire life. And it wasn't a vow that Samson put upon himself. It was a vow that God put upon Samson. Uh, God told the angel to appear, or uh, the, the angel appeared into his mother and, and said, t told her that this was going to take place. And Samson grew as a young man and it says that God blessed him and the Spirit of God was upon him and he began to move. And, and then we get a look at Samson's life. And how Samson broke every single part of the vow that God had, had set forth for him. Uh, uh, he touched uh, those things that were dead. Now we know that he touched dead men because the Bible talks about how he killed men. Uh, the, uh, the men of the Philistines, they, uh, they came up against him in battle. The, uh, he slew a thousand at one point in time with the jawbone of a, uh, of a donkey. And, and, and listen, uh, he, he touched those men, but that, the Spirit of God was upon him at that point in time. But I, I truly believe he broke that vow when after he killed the lion, uh, it says a lion had come up against, uh, had roared and come up against him, and, and it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he rent him in two with his bare hands. He killed this lion with his bare hands. And, that's quite a feat, by the way. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to wrestle a bobcat, let alone a lion. And uh, uh, but he, uh, I wouldn't want to wrestle a house cat if it was really mad at me. <laughs> My sister had a house cat, and, uh, and the window fell down on his tail, and the thing bit her like six times. I, I wouldn't want to mess with those things. But uh, that's what happened. And, and I don't believe that's where he, he broke that vow. But, 
the Bible talks about how he later came back and walked by it and saw that some bees had taken up residence in, this, in, this, uh, in the carcass of that dead animal and uh, had began to produce honey. And he ate of the honey that was inside of uh, this carcass, which is disgusting, by the way. Uh, but he, he broke that vow. He touched it. And then he took that and gave it to his parents. He broke that vow. He, uh, he, when he got married to the Philistine woman, uh, he, uh, he, there was a feast, a seven-day feast. That was the custom. And at those feasts, they got drunken. And, and in fact, I believe that's, that was uh, why Jacob, when Jacob got married and married, uh, married his first wife, Leah, he, it was supposed to be Rachel, they fooled him with Leah, I think it was because he was probably intoxicated, and he would have broken the second vow. Uh, the, the third vow was broken when Delilah, when Delilah convinced him to tell her where his strength came from, uh, and, and, and in the cutting of his hair. Now, the, the hair was important because at the end of the vow, in, in Numbers chapter 6, the, 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 when, when they had finished their vow, when they had, taken, taken the, 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 when they had served out the, the time of the vow, they were to go to the priest and their hair was to be shaved off and given to the Lord in, in, as a wave offering. It would be thrown upon the altar on, in the, into the fire. Uh, there was another, there was another uh, sacrifice that was to be made and the, uh, the, the priest would use it as a wave offering before the Lord. Why? Because it was a picture of all that, that, that they had done in sanctifying and setting themselves apart, right, in the service of God. He broke all of those vows. Look at me in Judges chapter 16, if you would. Verse 20. Now, we, we, know, we know the story. Delilah asked them several times where her strength came from because the Philistines had hired her to, uh, they, to, they threatened her and, and said, uh, listen, to tell, us, tell us where her strength comes from. And, and so she, she questioned him and several times he gave her the wrong answer. But finally, it says, that he's, I believe it's uh, here in verse 18, it says, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, he told her the truth, and she understood that he told her the truth, she went out and told the Philistines. It says, they came up unto her and brought money in their hand. She sold him out, and she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Now, that's a, that's a sad thing right there. The, the final vow was broken. His hair that had never been cut, the, the hair that uh, we, we perceived that his strength came from. Uh, we, listen, he broke the vow in other times. We talked about the grace of God this morning. We all fail at times, don't we? We, we make a mistake. And, 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 and I'm grateful for the grace of God that I don't have to go and, 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 and make some sacrifice uh, to get the, 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 the blessings of God and the Spirit of God back upon my life. What I need to do is 1 John 1.9 confess my sins before the Lord, right? Uh, if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But here in verse 20, after his head is shaved off, she's begin, begun to afflict him. His strength has gone out. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And this is what's scary. This next part of the verse. And he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. He didn't have a clue that the Spirit of God was no longer upon him and that his strength was gone. He, he, he wished not. He, he didn't know. Every other time that these, that these Philistines had come on, uh, listen, he'd let, let her bind him with, with, the, with, the, with the ropes, he, the, with new ropes that had never been, been used. He'd let her bind him with, the, with, the, with, the, with, with all other types of things. And, and every other time he'd gone out and just ripped those bindings off and killed the Philistines that had attacked him. But this time, this time there was something that was different. And it wasn't the presence of Samson. It was the presence of God in his life. He wist not that the presence of God, the Spirit of God, was not there, that his strength was gone. And the very next verse, it talks about how they gouged out his eyes, and they, they took him in, uh, to, uh, to, the, to their temple to, to make sport of him. And it goes through, and we, we understand if you've heard the story of Samson, he gets to the, the very end of his life, and he's, he's standing there before, before all these men, and he, he's blind, he can't see, and he, his hair has begun to grow back over, over a period of time. And, and he gets there, and he's behind, between these two pillars as he had a, a, a young boy lead him to the, between these two pillars and he calls out to God to return to him one last time that he might avenge his eyes, that he might be able to, to bring honor and glory to the Lord. And the Bible says that at that time that his strength came back to him and that he knocked down the, the, those pillars and the roof of that building collapsed and he killed more Philistines in his death than he did in all of his life. 
What happened? The Spirit of the Lord returned unto him. There's a blessing in that, right? Uh, understand that, that regardless of how far you've gone or how far you've fallen or what, what value you have broken into the Lord, God is a God of grace and of mercy, and he loves you, and you can have the Spirit of God upon your life again. You are not condemned to live in blindness and weakness for the rest of your life. God has called us out as Christians, as children of God, to be separate. To be sanctified, to, to be separate from this world and, and, and separated unto him. He's, he's given us his word that we can read and understand and grow. And, and, and he can, through the Holy Spirit and the word of God, he sanctifies us through, uh, through, the, through, the, through his word. Uh, Jesus prayed about his disciples. Uh, he prayed to the Father in, uh, in John chapter 17. He says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Listen, he sanctifies us in the same way. We're renewed in the spirit of our minds. We're renewed in, in our spirit and our soul as we get into this book and as we read it and we study it. But listen, sometimes we fail. And there are times when, when, we, when, when we fall and when we sin and, and it is easy to be like Samson in those times and to go out just like we had the day before and wist not that the Spirit of God was upon us. It is easy to let the, the, the things of this world to come upon us and to overwhelm us and to, to cause us to doubt. And listen, doubt, the Bible says anything that is not of faith is sin. It is, it is possible to allow that doubt to, to, to hinder what the Spirit of God can do in our lives. It is possible that, 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 that because of our sin we hinder what God can do. The Bible, and you say, we can't hinder God. The Bible says in, in, in the book of Psalms, talking about the people of Israel, I believe it's Psalms chapter 78, that they limited the Holy One of Israel. Israel. In the Gospels, it talks about how Jesus wanted to bless this, this certain town, but, but could not do so. He would have done so many more miracles, but because of their unbelief, he didn't. I don't want to ever get to the point in my life where I'm walking around and not knowing the Spirit of God is, that, is not there. But sadly, in today's day and age, I believe many, 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 many Christians. Now, when I say this is the Spirit of God, I don't mean that He doesn't indwell us. I believe that many times we're not yielded to the Holy Spirit of God, and we're, we're lacking the power of God. When's the last time you led somebody to the Lord? Or heard about somebody leading somebody to the Lord? Do you really think that the power of God to save is, has weakened? Do you think that God had just said, well, I don't want you to do it? I, 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 listen, do you really think the power of God cannot help you to overcome whatever sin it is in your life, whether it's gossip, whether it's, whether it's pride, whether it's anger, whether, whether it's pornography or, or some other type of sexual sin or, 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 or lust of the flesh? Or, listen, do we really think that the, the power of God is too little to help us to overcome those things? Or are we just walking around in the flesh saying, where is he? I don't understand it. Why can't I do it? Is it because we're not walking in the Spirit of God? Galatians chapter 5 says, if you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we are yielded to the Spirit, we're, we're, we're allowing Him to, to guide us in all that we do. So how do we get back there? We've fallen from that. It's really simple. So we, we talk about revival and, and, and wanting revival. And many times we talk about 2 Chronicles chapter 7.14. I love, I, I, I love this passage of Scripture. Turn to, to, to it with me if you would. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Many of you can probably quote it. It says, My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins, and will hear their lands. I have heard so many revival messages preached from that passage. In fact, I've preached revival messages from that passage, talking about how we can, if we seek God's face, if we, if we pray, if we turn from our wicked ways, then, then we can see revival in our land. And we talk about having a desire for revival. And I think back to the great revivals that we've had in our past. Uh, not necessarily in our, our past, but in our country. I think of the Great Awakening. Uh, it kind of laid the groundwork for the Revolutionary War, and, and 
and, and America being sprung up from that. Uh, uh, but, but many, many people here in, 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 in America uh, came to the Lord at that period of time. Uh, men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield preached, uh, and there were many other preachers, but God blessed and used them to see thousands of people saved up and down the, the, nor- the coast of here in the Northeast. I think uh, uh, of the uh, revival that happened in Wales that swept across the nation, and, and thousands of people got saved. It all started with, with, with a small group of people, young people, uh, teenagers, praying, and they got, they got to do something. I think about uh, the, the, the Isle of Louis uh, and, and the revival that took place there. The, the, man, it, when the, the, the preacher got there, the revival had already started, and the, the people were outside the church just looking for, the, uh, for some answer. And, and listen, we think about those great moves of God. Think, God, I want something like that to happen here. I want something like that to happen in our country. Because listen, our country needs it, don't we? Look at the state of our nation. And the state of, uh, uh, of our government. And listen, I, I don't hate our nation. I, I, don't hate our, I, I don't agree with many of the policies that our government has. But God has them there for a reason. In fact, the Bible says that the king's heart is in his hand. If they're there, it's because he's allowed them to be there. But they're just a product of the people in our country. The, 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 the number of children that are murdered on a, on, a, on a yearly basis, I believe Planned Parenthood last year was 320,000 children were murdered in a single year uh, as abortions. And they say, oh, but that's only a part of what we do. And listen, that's all of what they do. It's focused upon that, but hey, that's, not, that's only a portion of the, the abortions, the murders that take place of those, of those children. It's a wicked, terrible, vile, God, I'm sorry what our nation has come to. But here's the the thing. Our our nation was never founded on Christ. I want you to understand this. Founded on Christian principles, yes. But not Christ. And we've gotten farther and farther away from those biblical principles to the point now where they're laughed at and mocked. Does our country need revival? Absolutely it needs revival. But you know what needs revival more than that? Uh, there was a man who, who came, I believe it was a, a French man, he came and he says, he talked about the goodness of America and trying to figure out why America was so good and he, he, uh, or why America was so, so bountiful, bountifully and, and blessed. He says, listen, when America ceases to be good, America will, America will cease to, 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 uh, to, to be so blessed. Uh, the reason they were good is because they were following Christian principles. But we've gotten away from that. We, uh, it, it not, it not just in abortion, but uh, listen to everything. The sexuality and, and drugs and alcohol and, and just sin all around. It's just rampant in every, every area of the country that you look at. Do we need revival? Yes, we need revival. But this, this passage that we, I just read, 2 Chronicles 7.14, is a promise to Israel. Context is, per, is everything here. This, is, this takes place during the, 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 uh, the, the consecration of the temple. They, they, they're, asking, they're asking God to, to bless. And, and listen, God has said he's going to bless. He's, and this is the promise of God. He says, listen, uh, let's just read it. Go back up to, to verse, verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain or if I command the locusts or devour the land or if I spend pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. He's talking about Israel in the temple. If because of their sin, he brings punishment, he brings pestilence, and they turn back to him, he'll bring healing to the land. It is not a promise to the land of America. If you, you can search the scripture, you're not going to find a promise of revival for our country. There is no promise. Now that doesn't mean God can't do it. I am not going to say that God cannot bring revival to, to our country. He already has once before. He could do it again, but we don't have that promise. But you know what we do have a promise of? Turn over to James chapter 4. (coughs) 
James chapter 4 says in verse 8, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Who is this written to? Christians. This, uh, these are, this, this, this book is written to Christians, uh, uh, to, to brothers in Christ. He says, uh, if you draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Very, very kind of uh, similar wording to the promise that Israel had from God in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. That if we would humble ourselves and pray and seek his face that he would heal the land of, the, of Israel. But listen, here is to the Christians. He says, if you humble yourselves, if you mourn, if you weep, if you, if you understand that you're sin, there's a promise here uh, for, of individual revival. But God may not revive our nation. He may not revive the state of Maine. Uh, he may not revive uh, even the city of Augusta. Uh, and, and honestly, as much as he wants to, he may not revive our church. But he will revive you. If everybody in our church would seek God's face, if everybody in our church would humble themselves before the Lord and seek to be cleansed and confess their sin, listen, we would see church-wide revival. But you can't do that for your neighbor. You can pray that God does a work in your neighbor. You can pray that God does a work in the person. But before you look at that person, before you begin to pray for revival in our country, listen, the Bible says that he that regardeth iniquity in his heart, the Lord shall not hear him. If there is sin in your heart, if there is sin in your life, God will not hear your prayer of revival unless you're praying for you first. Read through Psalms 51 with me, if you would. We're not going to go through the whole psalm. But see, when we're talking about individual revival when we're talking about what, uh, what God can do in an individual, I believe what we see is individual revival here in the life of one man. I believe what we see here can happen in the heart and in the life of every child of God, that we can see revival. It says in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Look over, look down at verse uh, 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Before we can see real revival in our life, the first thing, the first step that we need to take is to ask and to seek uh, the, the cleansing, uh, a thorough cleansing. Uh, 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 of the word of God. Not, now when I say thorough cleansing, I don't mean a, uh, sorry, the first thing we do is, uh, yes, ask for, to, to have an honest approach unto the Lord. I'm getting ahead of myself. An honest approach unto the Lord. He asked for mercy. Why did he ask for mercy? Because he knew he was in sin. Remember, David had just been, uh, had just, uh, been approached by the prophet and said, David, thou art the man. He, he, he went out and he wept. He, he began to seek the Lord. And, and it was this that caused the penning of these words as the Holy Spirit moved upon him. And but listen, he saw there was a problem in his life and he was honest about it. He approached the Lord seeking for mercy. We are not a, we are not a people that like to be transparent with anybody. We, we, we come uh, to one another with a facade, with a, hey, how are you doing? Everything's fine, we, even though uh, the world is falling apart around our ears, right? We don't tell people how we're really doing because, and, and what's really burdening us because we don't think they want to hear it. And sometimes you're right, people don't want to hear it because people are people. But God cares. Now, that doesn't mean you don't, bear, you don't be honest with people. Well, that's not what I'm saying. But... God cares about everything. In fact, he already knows about everything, right? He's, he's omniscient. He, uh, the book of Isaiah talks about the, who, who has counseled the Lord. Nobody has counseled the Lord. He, he knows all and, and, thinks, and understands all. He knows and sees every area of your life. And listen, we need to have an honest approach with the Lord because until we're honest with the Lord and honest with ourselves, we're never going to see a need for revival. We'll look at the guy beside us and say, that person needs revival. But unless we're honest with ourselves, we're never going to look at ourselves and say, I need revival. Listen, this week, I, uh, on Friday, we were Friday night around 
I was sitting down talking to Jess, and I, I believe I was talking to Alicia, and somebody came over, and, and one of the other leaders says, hey, we're getting ready to play some basketball. Uh, uh, it's going to be a, a, a team leaders against uh, some of the teenagers. I haven't played basketball since I was 12, 18 years old, and I have never been good at it, ever. And, he, I, and I told him that. He was, that's okay, we just need a body. He got more of a cadaver than he got a body. Uh, but uh, I agreed, and I went out there, and I ran full-court basketball for, for an hour and a half. I was physically weary. I was physically tired. I was exhausted. I was, and listen, I, I, I was done. But every time they'd ask me, how are you doing? I'm okay. <gasps> I knew I wasn't Okay. I was the oldest person on that court by at least 10 years. <laughs> and I'm out of shape. Like, oh, you're fine, you're fine. I'm not fine. Listen, we need, to, we need to be able to be honest with ourselves and, and take an honest look at ourselves because we don't like to look at ourselves through the filter of the Word of God. We look, to like, look at ourselves in the, in the filter of our culture. And I'm okay as far as the, the culture is concerned. In fact, hey, I'm better than okay as far as the culture is concerned. But according to the Word of God, I fall short. Right? I have to honestly approach God in my prayer and, and seeking revival and say, listen, Lord, I, I, I need your mercy. I acknowledge my transgression. I've, I have sinned against you. And listen, there are times when we don't even necessarily know that we've sinned. Right? There's another psalm that says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See that uh, there be, listen, we need to seek God and seek His word to, uh, to, to apply to our lives, and, and this book is the mirror which, reveal, which will reveal the, the sin in our lives. That's how we grow, folks. We need to have a, an honest approach into the Lord. Secondly, we need, to, we need to be asking for a thorough cleansing. I, 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 I jumped ahead and mentioned this one earlier, uh, but a, a thorough cleansing. Look at verse 7 and verse 9 with me. It says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 9 says, Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Listen, a thorough cleansing means it didn't just wash a little bit of me or a little bit over here. A, a, a complete cleansing. A, it, it's not just a, a, a cleansing on the outside, but a cleansing on the inside as well. It's, it's, every, it's every aspect of my life, Lord. I'm asking you to cleanse it. And if you show me that I'm wrong, God, I, 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 I'll change it. But too many times we have this little back room this closet that's full of junk, that's full of sin, that's full of pride and anger and, and, and bitterness and unforgiveness, and we lock that door and say, God, you've got the rest of the house, but you can't have this room. This is mine. When I got married to my wife, she moved in and I lost everything. I am not kidding. I, I had a nice big closet in my bedroom and, and in the house of Palermo, and, and I came home the, the week after she moved in, and I went to get dressed the next day, and I said, where are all my clothes? They're in the hall, in the little closet in the hall. Huh? <laughs> I thought it was 50-50. She says, no, I got more clothes than you. So every morning I had to get dressed. I'd have to get up, walk out into the, into the hall. Thankfully, we didn't, nobody else lived in the house with us because it just scared everybody to death. And get my clothes. And uh, Listen, I, I want you to understand something. I had to give her the run of the place. Now, I'm not saying that everything is hers. It's ours, right? It's, it's a picture. Well, I'm just, when, I, when I got saved, I said, Lord, I want you to come into my life. And, and, and listen, I'm not saying that, that everybody's perfect from the time they get saved, but I had to open myself up. And there are times that in our lives that we lock away this area and say, no, this is mine, and you, you can't have it. That's not a thorough cleansing. That's that iniquity that I regarded in my heart. And God says, I cannot hear you. You want salvation, you've got to unlock that door and open it up and say, okay, Lord, go through it. And show me where I fail. And get rid of it. My wife is good at getting rid of things. I, in fact, I had a whole new wardrobe after about a month. She took all the clothes I bought at Walmart and she threw them away. And bought, and bought, uh, I, had, I can't wear the stuff she bought me now because I, I'm too old. But that was a long time ago. But listen, uh, she, she cleaned things out for me. And, and listen, my house was a whole lot nicer, by the, t by, by the way, after she moved in. I had curtains on windows, and, and it was clean. 
you'd be surprised what the Holy Spirit would do in our lives if we open ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to have complete reign in our lives. Don't, don't leave something aside. Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 12 talks about the casting aside that besetting sin. Listen, that's that thing that we, we carry with us that, 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 that's constantly slowing us down. Let the Holy Spirit get rid of it. You'll be better off. Open up the doors. We're to, have a, we're to ask for a thorough cleansing. And not break the microphone. Third, we're to... We're to have an admission and transparent confession. If I didn't need this, I wouldn't be doing this. But we're having to, we're to have a we're to admit with a transparent confession. Verse four: Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and be clear from thou when thou judgest. Now understand when he says this, he's, he's talking about a sin. Remember David's sin was, was not just against the Lord. Uh, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Bathsheba's husband and, and the entire family. He, listen, he, he, and, and in fact, the, the, the generals in his army, uh, uh, he caused them to murder Uriah. Uh, he sinned against a whole lot of people. But at this point in time, when, when he's coming looking for this, this, spiritual, this, this spiritual revival that he's, that he's truly seeking and needs at this point in time, his life, he understands that, that he's sinned against God, and that's worse than anything else he's done. And he comes to the Lord, and he's transparent. He says, I have sinned against thee. And, and I need you to forgive me. I need your cleansing in my life. Uh, he says, I need it above all else. He could have gotten uh, the family of Uriah to, to accept his apology, and he could have uh, went and apologized to Bathsheba and, and all the others that were involved. Listen, he got a whole lot of people involved. He didn't go to, he didn't go to Bathsheba's house and bring her. He sent somebody. To, that involved somebody else in his sin. He involved a whole lot of people in, in his sin. But the, the, the issue that needed to be dealt with was this issue that he had sinned against God. We need to be able to admit that, that how, how significant our sin is in the eyes of the Lord. We also need total conformity. Total conformity. Look at verse 10, 10 through 12. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take me not, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. He says, Lord, uh, uh, he, he's asked for forgiveness. He's, 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 he's sought the cleansing of the Lord, and, and now he's asking God to give him a clean heart, a new heart, a, 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 a right heart. Uh, there's, there's not just the, uh, listen, too many times we say, Lord, I'm sorry for this, and we go out and we do it again. Nothing has changed. Too many times we'll say, Lord, I don't want to do it again, but I'm, just going to, I'm not going to change anything or allow you to change anything in me. Listen, we're talking about total conformity to the Word of God and to, the, to, to what God would have us to do. He says, he says, uh, he says Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away in thy presence. Take not thy spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He, he, said, he says, fix me, mold me. Make me like you want me to be. If you were to, to I've never worked with potter's clay, but uh, sometimes they're, they're, they'll get air bubbles or, or other things that are in there that will just mess it up. Uh, I, I've watched a little bit on it. I've read a little bit on it. Uh, but before they, listen, you can get something that looks perfect and you put it in the fire, to, the kiln to fire it and, and, and have it harden and it will crumble because of the impurity that's in it. Do you know what you have to do before you can do that? You have to get the impurity, the air out. So you have to go and you have to knead it and you work it. And, and listen, it doesn't matter how pretty it looks, don't stick it in the fire because it's going to cause it to, to, to crumble. You have to get that impurity out. And, and listen, we had to be cleansed first. Then we can be molded into the shape, into what God would have us to be. Without the impurity. Conform to the image of God. Conform to his word. Romans chapter 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're to allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to transform us and to change us into what He wants us to be. Not to be conformed to, to this world. We, we're too good at that. Just be honest with ourselves. Look at the world around us and how far apart are we set? 
Are we truly sanctified? Now, I'm not saying we go live in some commune somewhere wearing, wearing like all uniforms and that, that's, that, that, that's crazy stuff. I'm not saying that's what we should do. I'm saying that we should be different. Are we different? Can the world tell that we're different? By the way that we talk, the way that we act, the way that we dress. Listen, look. look. Look at how they, I, I, I was driving down the road a couple of years ago and, and with my wife and we saw these little girls walking down the street and they looked like night workers, workers of the night, ladies of the night. Why? Because they make those clothes for little girls. Skirts are getting shorter and, 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 and tighter and I, I saw this thing the other day, it was, it was these guys trying to, 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 to guess how old, they couldn't guess, they were 19, 20 years old guys and they couldn't guess how, the ages of, of 13 and 14 and 15 year old girls. Why? Because they looked like they were 20 and 25 and 30. Our culture is changing and that does, that's not pleasing to God in the way it's moving. We're to be modest. It's, it's, uh, the, the beauty is to be inner beauty, right? Our, our godliness that, that, that attracts men, that, that we're to attract one another, not the physical aspect on the outside. Moving farther and farther away, uh, don't conform to the culture, conform to the Word of God. Allow the Word of God to direct us in, in how we live and how we act and how we speak and how we love one another. Total, we need total conformity to the Word of God. And, and lastly, with that we'll see an awakening of trust and confidence in our Lord. Verses 13 through 15. He says, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Verse 15. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. As we, see, as, we, as we humble ourselves, as we yield ourselves, as we confess our sin, as we're open and honest and really honest with the Lord and not with the facade that everybody has. Listen, we'll, God will begin to do something in our lives and as the forgiveness of God comes over us, the Bible says, blessed is the man whose transgression is, is, is forgiven. Listen, there's a, there's a happiness, there's a joy as the Spirit of God is, is restored unto us. And not that the Spirit of God was, was away from us, but that fellowship was broken. And, and listen, uh, I want you to say there's a joy that returns and that, and that brings back a trust and a confidence in, in God and we begin to praise him and, 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 and uh, talk to him with, uh, talk about him with others and listen, there, there's a, a change in us outwardly when this has been fixed. Now, I, I mentioned with our Sunday school, we'll end with this, when the Nazarite br broke his vow, he was to go before the, the priest. He was to shave his head. He was to bring a sin offering and another and a burnt offering. And they would they would they would they would they would make that offering for him for a sin, and he was to start his vow over again. If he was three and a half years into his vow, or if it was a three and a half year vow, and he was three years and 28 days into it, and he broke that vow, he would have to start all over again. But Samson didn't do that. Mosaic law required that, but Samson, Samson was bound. He was in the hands of the Philistines, and had his eyes gouged out. He had no ability to go and make, make, make a, uh, a sacrifice. He, his head had already been shaven for him, and that was what broke the vow. Through that period of time, his hair had begun to grow back. Look at Psalms 51. More than God required to desire the sacrifice. I want you to see what God really truly desires from us. It's found in verse 16 and 17. It's for, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Samson, unable to to, to bring those, those things back to the priest and to be cleansed, 
I'll tell you what he did have. He had a broken and contrite heart. He cried out unto the Lord, and the Lord heard him, and, and, and the Spirit came upon him again, and he, 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 he killed more in his death than, than he did in his life. And God, God moved upon him. I am so grateful for the forgiveness of God and the grace of God that we don't have to live our lives with, walking without the Spirit of God in control, without the power of God in our lives, thinking, what happens? But instead, we can have the power of God. When we talk about revival, all we're talking about is bringing us back into that right relationship with God, that, that fullness of the power of God, the yielding to the, to the Holy Spirit. Uh, yes, God can do that for a church, but it starts individually. Uh, when I say God can do it for the church, you know how it happens? Have you ever lit a match and set, set, set fire to something? Set fire to, to, to a pile of wood or some paper? It, it, it catches one thing, and then that catches the next thing, and that catches the next thing, and that catches the next thing. So, so, to, so today, uh, as a result of the Holy Spirit moving, God moves in one person's heart here today. It could be you, it could be you, it could be any one of us. And, and man, I have a desire that God would begin to do something in me. And Lord, I'm sorry, I've sinned before you. Forgive me for my sin and return it to me in joy of my salvation. And revival starts right here. And because of nearness, because of the increase of heat, of the, 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 the power of God in my life, it begins to convict the heart of somebody else. And God begins to touch their heart. And they get, they get fired up for the Lord. They, seek that, they, seek that, they see what they're missing. God begins to reveal something in them. And it begins to move from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. That's exactly how revival starts. I mentioned the Isle of Louis uh, years and years ago, back in the 1800s. It was a, a small uh, island community. Uh, a couple thousand people lived in this island over over in uh, the, it's uh, like it's Welsh a uh, Welsh area. And uh, they, there was a, a group of people that were meeting, praying for revival in their, in their area. They had a heart for the young people in their church that had wandered away and gotten sucked into the world of the parties and the, the drinking. And the, they had the same problems we did. They just wore different clothes. Right? They had, they had all the same issues, and they were, they were worried about those people. They were worried about the coldness in the churches. They were worried about the, the fact that nobody ever seemed to be touched by the, the Spirit of God when the Word of God was preached, and they began to pray. They got together, the leaders of the church, and some of the older ladies in the church got together. They began to pray together because they couldn't get out to the, to the other prayer meetings. And at one of the meetings, something happened that, that, that changed everything. One of, the, one of the leaders of the church, uh, not the pastor, uh, just a, a lay person in the church, uh, he'd gotten up to pray in one of the meetings and he, he began to, to quote scripture in his prayer. And it's the, the scripture we've heard. Uh, I, I've preached from this before. He says, uh, who shall stand in the holy hill? He that hath a clean hands and a pure heart. And he stopped. He stopped praying for revival for everybody else. He said, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And the reports are that he fell on his face and just began to weep. And God moved in that meeting and began to do something in the hearts of those men. And they saw that they needed revival. Not just the, not just the island of Louis. Not just their church, but they needed it. And through that, God sparked a revival that took over the entire area. Hundreds of, hundreds of young people, young men became pa preachers and pastors. And it, listen, it changed that area for, for, for decades, for generations, because one man finally said, God, I need revival. Not our country. Our country needs it. Absolutely. Not just the church. The church needs it. Not just our church. Our church needs it. God, I need revival. And that's where it starts. But we seek it for ourselves. And God does a work and brings us back into relationship with him. Father, I thank you for this day. God, I pray that your spirit Lord, be glorified, that Christ be glorified this morning. Lord, I pray that you use this for your own and your glory, that you do a work in each one of us. Lord, we have failed you many times. 
in words and actions, Father, sometimes in, in ways that we don't even know. And God, I ask that you would show us where we failed. God, I ask that you show me where I failed. Or that there would be nothing in my life that would hinder your work. God, I pray that you would, Lord, that you would just strengthen us, Lord, that we might seek your face. Lord, convict us of our sin if there's sin in our lives. Lord, I ask you to do all the work that needs to be done. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.